Jesse, welcome to Beyond the Inbox. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. No worries at all. Happy to be here. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into marketing? Yeah, so I've been in marketing literally since I left uni, actually, which is a far too long ago to even contemplate at the moment. But yeah, I, I worked for a startup in, um, in, uh, in the education space and I did very early stage SEO back then. And I just jumped from job to job, you know, adding my skill base around digital marketing, almost always in the kind of consumer marketing space, uh, and then landed a really big job at Etsy where I was head of performance marketing for the international markets there before starting my agency. What was Etsy like as a company to work for? At that time, it was really fun. We actually went through an IPO. The, they went through their IPO while I was there. So that was an exciting time to be in the business. Um, we were pushing really hard in terms of marketing leading up to the IPO. And then, um, you know, we went public and we kind of got to be part of that whole experience. So that was very, very cool. Um, it was amazing to work at a place that has so much data. You know, you're really looking at um, huge data sets and you're able to kind of analyze performance at a very, in a very kind of granular way. So that was a lot of fun. It also meant we had great relationships because of what we were spending. We had great relationships with people like Google who really wanted to support us um, and, our, and, you know, get us to spend more. <laughs> we're going to talk about pay today, but I do want to ask you what you just mentioned about getting your start in SEO. What are your thoughts on how SEO has changed over the last decade or so, especially with everything involving AI right now? <laughs> yes. Well, I've moved away from being hardcore into SEO in recent years because I've really focused on paid advertising, but I do keep my eye on the space for sure. And I think, yeah, it's really interesting. Like I come from the background of what it used to be all about, you know, getting the exact phrase intact into the H1 tags and repeating it throughout the article. And those days are definitely gone. I actually feel, this is an observation, I'm not sure other people have this, but I actually find that search engines now don't serve us as well as they used to because they try and anticipate what they think you want. Whereas I used to love being able to put the exact phrase that I wanted to find and then find an article about exactly that. I find now I get served very generalized kind of jack of all trades kind of content rather than the really specialist specific content that I'm looking for. So um yeah, and I think that impacts like the way we optimize as well. Um, but yeah, it's and with with AI, gosh, who knows what's going to happen? Because using AI to create content, where does that leave us once everyone's doing that? Speaking of content, I want to ask you about your current role at Webtopia mm -hmm. and what your day to day looks like. Interesting question. Yeah, so my day to day as a as a CEO and agency owner of an agency of around 20, staff of 20, means that I'm no longer in the day-to-day -day media buying role anymore. That's I stepped away from that quite a while ago because I had to focus more on like being, focusing on my business rather than being in my business. So I have a head of operations who heads up the delivery team and then we have heads of each department who are responsible for you know, making sure that what we're applying in terms of industry best practice is being applied. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the rest of the team are actually implementing work for the clients, but what my job is and what I see my job is, is really understanding what's going on in our industry, networking with other agency owners and big players in our space, getting ideas for what, you know, feeding ideas to the team for what we should be focusing on, what, what the, you know, the big changes are, keeping my eye on things like AI and then producing content around that and thought leadership content around what we're doing in the agency and what's working for us. Um, so it's kind of a, a job of like absorbing and collecting information and then also synthesizing that information for both my team, but also to build our profile as an agency. And it's, it's really fun. So I want to dig more into how you're managing paid for your clients. And the first question I have is, can you walk us through some of the optimization strategies you're currently using for paid social? Yeah, sure. So paid social uh, optimization has changed or paid social campaign management, I guess you would call it, or media buying has changed a lot in recent years. So the big, it's, it's been happening for a long time. It's been happening at Google. It's been happening at Facebook more and more actually AI-driven automated campaign decisions are being made by algorithms, right? So AI is definitely not new to this industry. 
Um, but that, as that has happened over time, the media buyer has in some ways less control over where the ads show or who they're being shown to or the targeting um, or needs to give up a lot of that control in order to get the best result from the algorithm. But our job is not to give all the control to the algorithm and just shrug our shoulders and let it run because if everyone did that, then who would win, right? So the only way to win is to understand the algorithm really well, set up your campaigns in a way that um, that work best for the algorithm and then analyze those results and make adjustments based on what we're seeing in terms of data. So although the days are gone both on the Google and on the Facebook side where you have very granular setups and very kind of um, complex A-B testing going on, that's now much more done by the algorithm. Uh, we are still having to stay one step ahead of like what setups and structures are working. So I can talk you through some of the things that are kind of working right now in the agency and that we're doing a lot of. So um, the, the Advantage Plus campaign option is in, in Meta. It came out, uh, gosh, probably more than a few months ago now. Um, and it's become a key part of like our campaign structure for most of our clients. So this is the most automated campaign option available. Um, it generally works for brands spending more than 10K a month, but actually we've been testing it on smaller brands as well. Um, I mentor some smaller brands and they've been getting good results from it as well. Um, and essentially the advice I would give around Advantage Plus is ideally you want to have a library of running, winning ads that work and use those in Advantage Plus rather than using it for testing. So test your ads outside of Advantage Plus. But saying that, you know, every rule has someone who says the opposite. So I have heard of, you know, other agency owners that I know talking about actually doing creative testing within Advantage Plus now as well. So, um, so that's one of the things we, we tend to have inside an ad account as one of our kind of setups. Um, another kind of more advanced tactic that we might use is cost caps. So cost cap bidding allows you to basically set a limit with Facebook as to how much you're willing to pay for a conversion or in terms of ROAS uh, and allow the, the algorithm to decide how much to spend based on that limit that you give it. Obviously, the more you limit it, the less it's going to be able to spend. The more free reign you give it, the more it will be able to spend. Um, and this doesn't always work for all accounts, but it's definitely something that works for some accounts and can be a great way to run your campaigns. Um, and then we have other options like CBO versus ABO. Um, so CBO is campaign budget optimization. ABO is ad set budget optimization. Uh, we tend to use at the moment more ABO in our ad accounts. But again, like all tactics, we might sometimes test CBO again in an account and find that it works really well. And then we might test it in some other accounts and find that it does or doesn't work for them. So it's about having a toolbox of things that you might test, different setup arrangements that you might test for an account to, to see what works best. Um, another kind of tool in the toolbox is a campaign type we call Dabber or Dynamic Ads for Broad Audiences. That's when you use the catalog and you allow Facebook to show your catalog of products to people that might be searching for those types of products. That's sort of like moving into Advantage Plus campaigns a little bit now, but also can also be a separate campaign type. So those are some of the tools we're using and how we set them up within each ad account. We usually start with like a standard framework and then we adjust it based on what we're seeing perform best for that particular ad account. Lots to unpack there. I think what I want to do is focus on the nuts and bolts of a high-performing ad. So I want to ask you, to discuss the importance of creative in paid social and some of the psychological frameworks you use when coming up with ideas? Yeah, sure. That's a great question. So yeah, the, as I said earlier, the, the media buying game has definitely changed. And one of the things as there's become, as it's become more automated and more algorithmic in terms of the kind of the targeting um, and the setup, what's become much more competitive and more difficult to win at is creative. And essentially we're in a situation now where the ad costs, although maybe not the highest they've ever been because they have come down a little bit recently, they're generally very high. So after the, as the pandemic kind of rolled on, ad costs became a lot higher. There's a lot more competition out there in the sort of D2C space in which we operate. You know, there is 
more e-commerce brands than there ever were before, and they're all competing for our eyeballs. So the game of convincing someone to part with their hard-won cash, especially at the moment where cash is a little bit um, in short supply for people, is even harder. So we have to have really great creative, and that's kind of the battlefield of how you can win at this game. I would say creative and then like where you're sending people, so the landing page that you're sending people to, and both of these should be employing you know, psychological frameworks that understand human psychology and buyer behavior. Um, so the first step really is you've got to understand your customer. So you shouldn't be making assumptions about why your customer buys. You should be asking them. So if you're new to, to, to your product's new and you're a startup, you should be doing customer research before you go too much further down the track of developing, you know, further products or launching ads. If you already have a product and you already have customers, you should be talking to them and asking them, you know, why they bought from you. You can do post-purchase surveys. Um, you can organize to, you know, have interviews with them. You can also, um, uh, you can also email them, asking them questions. There's lots of different ways you can get information from your customers about why they're buying from you. And oftentimes, if we assume it's one reason, we're actually not right. Um, the other way we can understand why customers are buying is by looking at reviews. So we can mine the reviews of our own products and look for kind of general sentiments and themes. But we can also mine the reviews of competitors or even alternatives in the space. So if you were, for instance, um, a reusable nappy brand or diaper brand, as they say in the US, you might also look at like what are people's complaints or issues around disposable diapers what are their kind of pain points around those and how might my product solve them so that's the first step is really understanding the why behind why your customer is likely to buy their pain points and also what their objections might be and then you want to formulate some hypotheses and test those you probably have some hypotheses around which personas as well that you're that you might be targeting so you might have one or you might have several and you might not be sure which one is the best or they might, they might all be good. So you might be creating ads for um, a number of different personas um, or you might be just creating them for one. It depends on how much budget you've got to test, you know, how fast you want to move. There's a lot of factors that might define that. So let's assume then you now understand pretty well what your customer's pain points are, what the um, reasons are to buy. Now we've got to think of like, how are we going to communicate to that to them in a succinct way through creative? So there are different, um, different frameworks we, you can use. There are different um, visual frameworks you can use, different psychological frameworks. So maybe it would help if I gave you a few examples. So um, the most obvious one is pain point agitate solution. So this is a classic and it still works. So you call out the pain point that the customer has, you agitate the pain point, make them kind of understand it even more or make them feel that pain even more, and then you present the solution. Um, and then the solution is obviously to then buy your product and, and go to your site. So that's one example. Um, in doing so, we're always wanting to present the benefits of buying the product versus the features and don't assume that someone necessarily is solution aware and you just need to tell them why your solution is better than another solution they might not be solution aware or they might um uh, they might not really understand the features but they want to understand the reason why they should buy from you in the first place um another consideration to think about in terms of psychology is people don't tend to buy rationally they tend to buy emotionally so we think that we're rational human beings, but we're actually not. We're still, our brains really haven't developed from when we were tribes, you know, living in the wilderness. Um, so if you think about that when you create your ads, people, what does your product align to in terms of a core human need? Does it align to someone who um, feels a sense of not belonging and the product will make them feel, belo you know, belong? Does it align to their need to be desirable, to find a mate? Does it align to their need for comfort and shelter? Does it align to their need to, to, um, to have pr uh, status in the tribe? So which one of these is your product most aligned to? 
And then you can talk about the, you know, that you can use your ad to kind of agitate that particular pain point and focus on that. Um, a good example, I think, is user-generated content. The reason why user-generated content is so powerful and has, we've seen such a upsurge in people using that for DTC advertising is because it actually is that kind of tribal effect. Like other people like me like this product and I trust those people more than I trust a brand who could be a rival tribe trying to get me to do something. So UGC doesn't work just because it's UGC. It works because it, it taps into that human human need to have advice from other members of your tribe. So your UGC, for instance, can, if you represent different types of people in there, or at least the myriad of people who might be interested in your product. So don't just always show the ideal person. Show a mixture of different people that your target audience could identify with. And if they see themselves reflected in the ad uh, and it looks like a person like them recommending it, that's going to ignite that part of their brain that feels like they belong and, um, and that your product is going to serve their needs. So yeah, hopefully that's a few ideas to get started. Yeah, there's so much to unpack here, Jesse. I was taking notes as you were speaking. I want to ask <laughs> you about the problem agitation solution formula. It's well known in copywriting. And is this something that you are literally using as a framework with copy? Or is this something that you can layer into certain types of creative as well, like videos and images? Yeah, so it's not just being used for copywriting. It's definitely being used for video, for static imagery as well. So it might be, if it was a static ad with a static image, it might be that we just call out the pain point and the static in the image, and then the copy might present the solution or vice versa. The copy might call out the pain point and then the image might present the solution. If it's a video, you might have a whole story. So a typical kind of ad framework, I guess, that we use a lot is um, is the sort of day in, day in a life kind of TikTok style ad. So for instance, someone might be, um, might say something like, I was really struggling with like acne on my back and I didn't know what to do. And I looked online and I came across this product and it looked really good. So I ordered it. It arrived in two days. Um, I put it on. My boyfriend helped me put it on and I've been putting it on for a week. And and now look, my, my back knee's gone. It's called back knee, back acne. Um, so that's telling the story from their point of view. So it's the pain point of like they had this problem um, and you might agitate it as well. So they might kind of close up on the image or how they felt embarrassed or how it made them feel so that the customer is kind of um, identifying with that emotion that they feel. And then you're presenting them the solution. So that's an example of how you can use pain point agitate solution in a video format. I love what you mentioned about the core human needs. And when I was listening to you, I was thinking of the weapons of persuasion from Robert Cialdini's book. And I was also thinking about triggers from Joseph Sugarman's book. Is it helpful before start before you start writing ads, is it helpful to start with, we call them angles in drip. Is it useful to start with an angle in mind such as, okay, I want this ad to touch on social proof. I want this ad to touch on, like you said, status. Would that be a helpful way to get started with writing these types of ads? Yeah, definitely. That's a great way. Like we often end up with a spreadsheet where we've got like the personas in one column and then like what are the angles for, you know, what are the different potential angles that ad could take for that particular persona? So if it was like a yoga leggings brand, you know, there might be the busy mom, there might be the, you know, hardcore yogini, and then there might be the kind of reluctant act, 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 act uh, reluctant exerciser. Um, and then each one of those might have a different angle for wanting to buy the product or a set of different angles. And then once we've got the angles, we then want to come up with a creative framework that we're going to use to illustrate the angle. So in the example of agitate pain point solution for the back knee, you know, the framework we're using is the day in the life framework of a kind of a TikTok style ad. Another framework we might use, a typical one we use a lot is us versus them. So um, if the angle of the leggings was like, you know, the busy mum wants to be able to wear it, wear the leggings to school, pick up, to work, to her exercise class, and then out to the, to the bar afterwards. So we might do a, um, an, an us versus them 
illustration of the the leggings that she's that we're advertising versus the ones that aren't as good because they you know they're not good for the gym for this reason and they don't look good in a bar or whatever it might be you know putting them side by side so that comparison can be another creative framework that we can use to illustrate the angle so we we have lots of creative frameworks that we kind of have in our toolkit but we also might come up with a brand new one you know like we need we're going to have a guy like running down the road and jumping into a lake might be the you know the creative idea we come up with to illustrate the angle other times we might you know rely on tried and true frameworks that we've got in our toolkit how do you approach building versus optimizing when thinking about paid social so what do you mean by that exactly like in terms of like building a campaign versus like keeping it running yeah, how do you strike this balance between continuously testing new ad creatives and optimizing those that are working or certainly have the potential to work well? Yeah, so that's a great question. So I think one thing to always understand is that the job of the person running, you know, your paid media, whether that's an in-house person or an agency, is always going to be about continuously coming up with new creative ideas and continuously testing them. There's no day when you're finished and it's done and you've got your ads and you just run. You, you will always be having to come up with new creative concepts. The volume and the speed at which you have to do that depends at what phase of your evolution that you're at and also at what, um, and your ad account. Now, I heard a stat the other day that Fabletics made 59,000 adverts last year. I heard it on Twitter. I don't know if it's totally true. But that gives you an idea of a very big brand, how much they're having to iterate their creative. So it doesn't stop. So that's one thing to bear in mind. But in terms of your question of like, how do you kind of know whether to create new ads or like maybe improve the ads you've got? We have a framework we use in the agency where we, uh, we analyze the ads kind of from start to finish. So we would look at when we launch new ads, we would... Um, we would run them for a little while. We would look at the hook rate, the hold rate, the hold power, the conversion rate, the click-through rate. So if an ad might be converting well, but the beginning of it isn't really hooking people in, so the hook rate is lower than average, then we might take that same ad that we know converts and we might put a different hook at the front of the ad, the first three seconds. We might make it a bit more punchy or something different at the beginning and run that ad again and see if it performs better. Or if we've got an ad that's been performing well for a long time, we know it's great, we might, uh, and but it's running out of steam or we're worried that it's going to run out, you know, it's going to fatigue, then we might take the ad and make some small tweaks to it to iterate on it um, and make it better. You might have a, an ad created by a UGC creator that's worked really, really well. The framework's done well, it's done amazing. So you might get another UGC person, maybe someone who looks different, who's a different gender or race, to do one in a similar way, maybe with a similar script. Um, and then you get to kind of use that framework again, but provide something new to the algorithm. So iteration is a huge part of what we do for sure, but you can't get away from the fact that new creative will be required regularly, you know, as you scale. How can smaller brands manage something like that, especially those with very few people on the marketing team? Is there an MVP version of them being able to do something like this? Yeah, I think definitely. So on a lower budget, you are going to have less of a hungry need for creative, but you are going to have to go through a process of testing to get to like a, you know, a good level of performance that you're happy with. So I mentor some smaller uh, e-com brands that aren't quite ready to work with an agency. I mentor them in a small group and that's exactly what I work with them on. So I give them these kind of frameworks and ideas around their creative. I get them to really think carefully about their personas, what the angles are, um, what the benefits are of their product, and then use these different frameworks as ways of um, positioning those arguments to the customer. Um, and so, yeah, it can definitely be done. A lot of these founders are creating their own ads themselves. They're sourcing UGC. There's, there's tools you can use. Things like CapCut is a great video editing tool that you can just use on your mobile or on your desktop makes it super, it's kind of social style editing. The ads don't have to be high production value at all. In fact, oftentimes if they're not, they perform better. Certainly the TikTok style ad 
you know, is a winning ad that off uh, ad style that really doesn't require a lot of high production. Get your phone phone out and film. You know what uh, a friend of mine on Twitter says is ugly ads. Ugly ads actually often convert. So I think not being afraid to try things, but recognizing that a portion of your time will have to be towards coming up with creative to get your account to perform. What are some What are some common mistakes you see brands making? in their ad accounts and how would you suggest they improve their results? Yeah, common mistakes I see are too much granularity, like trying to test too many different things at once, especially when the budget's low, right? So you want to have at least two conversions a day per ad set in order to give enough data to the algorithm. Facebook would say you actually need 50 conversions a week per ad set, but that's too high for some smaller brands, right? Um, So I would say, uh, yeah. Uh, two per day at least per ad set is really important Um, and don't go after the shiny objects another mistake in terms of like trying to test loads of different things another mistake I see people make is like trying to if they're in the early stage trying to run ads on Google and Facebook at the same time um, as a way to kind of like they think reach more people but actually if you've got a small budget you actually want to focus on one or the other and whichever one is best and you can do a little bit of brand advertising on Google but actually focusing on one channel and really understanding it and getting good at it is going to be much more, um, it's going to work with the algorithm much better if you can give more data to one platform and also be better at, um, at you know, the creative or whatever else is involved to get that platform to work. That's another mistake I see. And then I guess common one is just not having good creative, testing creative properly, not having enough creative in the account, bad copy. Copywriting is super, super important. I've seen it time and again, how much copy can improve the performance of your ad account. So that's really important. Um, Those are the main things, yeah. Jesse, we're soon coming to the end of our time here. And I want to ask you, how do you think the paid social landscape will evolve in the next few years? And what trends are you keeping an eye on? Oh, so interesting. Yeah, I think we'll see continued automation of the media buying process, but there will always be a role for media buyers to help analyze what's going on and stay on top of the platforms. I can't see a day, and this is not just me as an agency owner being like trying to save my own job. I can't see a day where we would just get, say, to Facebook, here's my budget, go and find me customers. Because at the end of the day, everyone's going to be giving their budget to Facebook and who's Facebook going to choose? Well, Mm -hmm. Facebook's going to choose whoever optimizes best or gives it the best data or sets it up in the best way. So I think there's always going to be a role of keeping an eye on the platforms. Um, And creative, I think, will continue to be the battleground. We're going to see a lot of interesting stuff happening with creative and AI. And people that harness that in smart ways are going to win for sure. Um, So yeah, I think that's going to be really interesting. Copywriting, the design process, the filming process. Even, you know, will UGC become fully AI generated? Maybe, maybe not. That's um, all remains to be seen, but it's going to be a fun ride, I think. I'm excited. I I am too. And I do feel like those that are ahead of the curve when it comes to AI are the ones that will benefit most, and certainly in terms of when it comes to creative. Yeah, totally. Yeah, we've started doing some AI creative for our clients, and it's pretty interesting. Like, we had a client who has a a kind of video game that's quite spooky and we got all these spooky images created and they're honestly awesome. That's fascinating. Well, Jesse, we are coming to the end of our time now. I have enjoyed this conversation so much. As someone that doesn't work too closely with paid, I have so many notes here to reflect on. Where can our listeners go to learn more about what you're doing and Webtopia in general? Sure. So I have got a uh, downloadable uh, guide. I can give you everything that's working right now in paid social media buying. It's like a checklist that you can use. So if you want a copy of that, then just email hello at webtopia.co and me and my team will get back to you and send that right over. So that, yeah, hello and then webtopia.co. And you can follow me on LinkedIn and Twitter. So just search my name, Jesse Healy on LinkedIn and I should come up. And Twitter, I'm Jesse underscore Webtopia. Perfect. Well, we'll put all those links in the show notes. And Jesse, I want to thank you again for taking the time to join us today and all the best in the future with Webtopia.
Thanks so much for having me.